you know, diabetes is one of those topics where, you know, it, it seems like it's so easy, right? But at the same time, I would say that this is one of the, first of all, one of the most common comorbidities patients have, right? Come on. They come into the clinic, pretty much what's on their past medical history report is diabetes. It's so freaking common. And that's the reason why on the MPTE, you need to know this backwards and forwards, how it presents, signs and symptoms, impairments, things that you need to address as a physical therapist, especially as it relates to how to treat these patients well. All right. And when I say treat them well, I'm talking about making sure that you're not exercising them when their blood sugar is too low or their blood sugar is too high. You know, that becomes a major issue. All right. So, like I said, lock in those answers, your final chance. Let's go ahead and knock this one down. For this week's clinical file, we have Eric, and Eric has a history of uncontrolled diabetes and has been non-compliant with the administration of his insulin medication. Upon examination, the patient has severe scarring in the right lower abdominal area from repeated injections. Which of the following is the best rationale for avoiding repeated injections? All right, so we got our answer choices. We have A, hypoglycemia is likely to occur, increasing the risk for falls. B, hyperglycemia is likely to occur, leading to seizures and convulsions. C, metabolic acidosis can occur leading to organ failure. And D is hypoglycemia can occur leading to extreme thirst and frequent urination. All right, those are our answer choices. I know this was a mouthful, big question here. So you want to slow up and make sure you're understanding each piece of it. Again, we're looking at diabetes right now. All right, a very common concept to show up on the MPTE, so we got to make sure that we understand this well. All right, let's start off at the top. We got Eric has a history of uncontrolled diabetes. Now, ask yourself right now, what is the most common form of diabetes? Like, what's the one that you're always hearing about in school, on practice exams? It's diabetes mellitus, right? Now, let's say, let's say we go a little bit further. Not just diabetes mellitus or diabetes, right? Which type is actually going to be more prevalent? Which one would you say is more common to show up in your clinic? It's type 2, right? Type 2 di diabetes mellitus. Now, in this question, it says the patient has uncontrolled diabetes. It doesn't tell me type 1 or type 2. But looking from a common perspective, what's the most likely? I would say we're, we're likely dealing with type 2. Now, let me, before we move on, I, I hate to do this because it does disrupt me going through the question, but I have to add this extra piece in. If on your MPTE, it shows up and it says uncontrolled diabetes, I don't want you necessarily like overthinking this thing and like, oh, I wonder if it's one or if it's two or if it's three or if it's four. Like, I don't want you doing that. If the test did not give that to you and there's no extra information in the question to infer that it's diabetes type two, then don't mess with it. It means that you don't need to know that in order to answer the question, all right? Don't overthink it. Okay, so let me back up a bit. Let's start off at the top of the question again. I know I stopped our flow. So it says, Eric has a history of uncontrolled diabetes and has been non-compliant with the administration of his insulin medication. Now we know that diabetes is a metabolic condition where the body is having trouble utilizing glucose. Why is it having trouble doing that? Well, if you have type 2, it's because there's what we call insulin resistance, right? There's insulin resistance, meaning that, you know, the body's really not able to bring glucose into the cells because the body's not responding to insulin anymore. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with insulin, insulin is responsible for helping glucose get into the cells so we can use it and convert it into energy. All right, bottom line, what do I need you to write in your notes? That insulin is super important for getting the glucose out of the bloodstream and into the tissues that need it. All right, in order to use it for energy. Okay, does that make sense? So I know our patient has uncontrolled diabetes. They're non-compliant with the administration of their insulin. So that means that they're not taking it regularly like they should. If I don't take insulin regularly like I should, 
giving the the explanation I just gave you, what are you thinking is going to happen to this patient? If I'm not taking my insulin, and I know insulin's responsible for bringing glucose out of the bloodstream into the tissues that need it, right? The tissues that use it for energy, what's going to happen? Glucose is going to stay where, y'all? Out in the bloodstream. All right, I'm glad we on the same page. Let's keep it moving. It says, upon examination, the patient has severe scarring in the right lower abdominal area from repeated injections. Those of you who know um, people who have diabetes, you may know that they often may inject themselves. Some people have a pump and they're not like repeatedly injecting themselves with the insulin, but there are patients that do, right? Uh, and they inject themselves with it. And one of the rules that we have for those patients, like when they're trained at the doctor's office about injecting themselves, they're, they're often trained not to inject the same area. Why? Because it leads to scarring of that area. Well, that's not good. I mean, we don't obviously want to scar the tissue over. From a cosmetic perspective, it doesn't look good. But also, there's another thing that happens. There's another reason why I don't want to inject that same spot and cause this scarring in that area. Does, do you think scar tissue, when it builds up in an area, do you think that things like insulin or even blood flow is able to pass very easily through that area? Not really, right? That scar tissue doesn't really allow nice passage of fluid through. And so if I'm injecting myself in an area that's scarred down, that means that the insulin's probably not going to be able to pass through very easily or quick enough anyway and get into the bloodstream. That's a problem because I need insulin. All right, I need this. And so in the question already, it's telling me, all right, patients repeatedly injecting themselves in this area. It's scarred down. And now we may be potentially having a problem where the patient's not getting the insulin that they need. All right. So it's saying which of the following is the best rationale for avoiding repeated injections? Like, why would I tell my patient, you know, why repeated injecting themselves in the same spot is a bad thing? Why is that a bad thing? And now we get down to our answer choice. For those on the podcast, let's go ahead and look at it. A says hypoglycemia is likely to occur, increasing the risk for falls. B says hyperglycemia is likely to occur, leading to seizures and convulsions. C is metabolic acidosis can occur, leading to organ failure. And D is hypoglycemia can occur, leading to extreme thirst and frequent urination. Let's let's just knock these down. A. It says hypoglycemia, so, so that's decreased blood glucose, right? And then it says is likely to occur increasing the risk for falls. Well, is that statement by itself true? That hypoglycemia, someone who has low blood sugar can or will have a likely increase in risk for falls? Yes or no? So I would say, yeah, you know, if your blood sugar's low, a lot of patients get very dizzy, weak, all these different things, and it can increase the risk for falls. That is true. My question for you, though, do I see hypoglycemia in a patient who is like repeatedly injecting the same spot with insulin? The answer to that is no, I don't. I would actually see the exact opposite, hyperglycemia. Why? Well, let's go back to what I was saying. We said that the role of insulin was to do what? Help glucose get from the bloodstream into the tissues that need it. The tissues that use it for, to break down that glucose and use it for energy, right? All right. Now, here's the, here's the thing. If I'm not getting insulin that's getting into my bloodstream quick enough because of that scar tissue, What's going to wind up happening? Where is the, the glucose going to be? Is it going to be inside the cells being used like it should? Or is it going to be outside in the bloodstream not being used like it should? It's the second one, right? So when you have a ton of sugar out in your bloodstream, what is that called, y'all? What's that condition called? It's called hyper glycemia. There we go. And so, A, I don't like it as an answer. I wouldn't expect to see hypoglycemia. I would expect to see hyperglycemia. 
Let's look at B. B says hyperglycemia. Ding, ding. I like this so far. The rest of it says is likely to occur leading to seizures and convulsions. I know part of this answer is correct. The hyperglycemia part. I like it. My question to you is, does hyperglycemia likely lead to seizures and convulsions? The answer to that is no. I would see these seizures, convulsions, coma. I likely see those with hypoglycemia. I don't typically see that, or it's not as likely to be seen with hyperglycemia. And so although I like hyperglycemia as the answer, the rest of the answer is incorrect. Let me read that answer to you again. It says hyperglycemia is likely to occur leading to seizures and convulsions. And I say absolutely not. It is not likely to lead to those. So I'm going to put a big X next to B. Let's look at C. C is a very common one that I know you've heard. Metabolic acidosis can occur leading to organ failure. I'm going to slow up here. I like this answer. And the reason being is that I know diabetes is a metabolic condition. All right. I know that if a patient isn't getting their insulin or if they're repeatedly injecting an area and the insulin's not diffusing into their bloodstream, well, I know that hyperglycemia happens. Are we all on par with that? Those of you in the car on the treadmill right now, can we get can you shake your head yes? Are we in agreement with that? Everybody here right now? Can we put clear down in the comment box if that's clear? Okay. So we know that our patient will end up with hyperglycemia. Now, here's the thing. As your blood sugar gets too high, the body starts to realize like, oh, shoot, you know, these muscles, they need, they need this energy in order to continue to work. They need ATP, right? We need to have the glucose there for these muscles. However, the muscles aren't getting it. These tissues aren't getting it. So what does the body do? What's the body's response when it realizes that the muscles need this energy, but they're not getting it? It starts to break down fatty tissue. It does, all right? It starts to break down fatty tissue because that is also a source of energy for the body. All right, so it starts to break that down. Now, here's the deal. It's not the problem of breaking down the fat. It's the, because you might be like, oh, that's a great thing. But here's the problem, that the byproduct of breaking down fat for energy is this thing called ketones. When we have ketones that start to build up in the body as this byproduct, it leads to this thing called ketoacidosis. There you go. All right. And these ketones, what they're going to do is they're going to decrease that pH. They're going to cause an acidosis or acidotic situation. Now, let me come back from all of that technical babble right there and say this to you, that if a patient is not getting the insulin, whether they're not producing it or whether they injected that same area multiple times and it's just not getting into the bloodstream, whatever it is that the patient's body will now start to break down fat and try to use that for energy. The byproduct of it is ketones. Ketones do what to the pH, y'all? They decrease it. They lower it, causing acidosis. So I love C right now as the answer. It says metabolic acidosis. That fits. Now the rest of the answer says can occur leading to organ failure. Well, have you ever heard of diabetic ketoacidosis? Because that's really what we're talking about right now, diabetic ketoacidosis. And, and a lot, oftentimes, this is what happens when your sugar levels get above a 300 milligrams per deciliter. All right. Now, here's the thing. When, you're, when your body becomes very um, acidotic or there's a lot of acid in your, well, I'm not going to say a lot of acid in your bloodstream, but if your pH gets low, right? And, and your, your body becomes in an acidosis state, what tends to happen is organ failure. All right. That's one of the things. And that's the reason why when you find that your patient is in di diabetic ketoacidosis, it's a medical emergency. I need to send them to the emergency room. Why? Because that situation rapidly leads to organ failure. All right. And that's exactly what C is really saying. It's not directly saying that to you, 
but it's saying this whole metabolic acidosis can lead to organ failure. Yes or no? The answer to that is yes, absolutely it could. Doesn't mean it's the right answer, but it's looking really good. Let's look at D. D says hypoglycemia, which we've already said is not likely to show up in this patient case. But let me read the full answer. It says hypoglycemia can occur leading to extreme thirst and frequent urination. Not only is hypoglycemia not likely to occur, but when a patient has hypoglycemia, do they often have extreme thirst and frequent urination? Absolutely not. That's more consistent with a hyperglycemia that you would see the person wanting to drink a lot. Why? Because they have so much sugar in their bloodstream, so much glucose, and, and they, what they're trying to do is dilute it. And so they'll try to drink a lot, right? Extreme thirst there. And then obviously as we're drinking a lot, we start urinating a lot, right? Or are you wanting to use the bathroom, I should say. So D is not the correct answer here. And as I look at all of them, A, B, C, and D, you know which one is the absolute best? C. There it is. All right. Final answer is metabolic acidosis can occur leading to organ failure. If that was clear, go ahead and put clear down in the comment box. If you got this question correct, congratulations. Not an easy one. It's not just blaring in your face. You have to do a little mental gymnastics to get down to the right answer here. All right. So I congratulate you. One thing that, um, you know, I was always taught uh, by my CI when I was in PT school uh, just was kind of like these sayings, right? There, there would be these sayings and that would kind of help you to understand whether your patient was experiencing hypo or hyperglycemia. Can I, can I tell you those right now? All right. So the, the saying was hot and dry, their sugar's high. Hot and dry, the sugar is high. And so what that really means is that when your patient is complaining of them being very hot, when they, they're dry, they're not really sweating a lot or anything like that, those are symptoms consistent with hyperglycemia. Hot and dry, their sugar is high, all right? The other one is cold and clammy, you better get them some candy. Cold and clammy, you better get them some candy. Why candy? Because that's glucose, right? Um, and, and typically patients who are hypoglycemic, they tend to be cold, feel cold, they're shaking, right? Um, but also another thing is that they're clammy, all right? So that's definitely something to take a look at. You know, again, cold and clammy, get some candy for hypoglycemia, hot and dry, their sugar's high for hyperglycemia. Hopefully that little mnemonic will stick with you. Um, obviously there's a few other signs and symptoms I need you to be aware of. And that's the reason why I create cheat sheets for y'all. So you can have, you know, these concepts like readily available to you and you can review them as you get ready for the APTE. Sounds good? All right, so here you go. If you're on the podcast right now, first of all, I want to say thank you for your support, your reviews. Thank you for telling people about this. We're almost to a million downloads. That's crazy. That is so crazy. Thank you for that. Um, and for that, what I want to do is I want to get you a cheat sheet to help you study for the MPTE when it comes to diabetes, all right?